Hello, everyone. We will have two speakers today. We have Jorgen Adolfsson, who's the head of the SciLife Lab Mass Cytometry Unit and Core Facility Flow Cytometry Unit at Linköping University in Sweden. And Dr. Charles Martin, who's our Director of Marketing for Curiox Biosystems. The presentation will last approximately 25 minutes. Please type your questions in the question box and they will be addressed at the end of the session. A recording of this webinar will be available shortly after this presentation at www.curiox.com. Without further hesitation, Dr. Charles Martin. Thanks, Sheila, and welcome to our webinar. We're excited to share uh, some more customer results with you, and we have some previous webinars already posted on our website if you're interested in those. Our main speaker, Jorgen, will follow my presentation, which will be short, and will share experiences and data from his mass cytometry work. And many who perform mass cytometry will immediately see the value of laminar wash technology in their work. So with the rapid growth of cell therapy clinical trials and a couple of products, Kim Raya and Yes Carta, on the market, the demand for cell analysis is ever increasing. Since the cells are the product, flow cytometry will be used from basic research all the way through manufacturing QC and patient testing. Flow cytometry has been essential to the preclinical development and clinical monitoring of CAR T cells since these studies were first initiated. Cells are also screened for vi viability before being prepared for infusion back into the patients. So because of the, these reasons, consistency and reproducibility across time points, locations, and operators are becoming ever more important for these types of therapeutic products. There has been tremendous effort in flow cytometry community to standardize workflows and produce robust flow data that can be compared independent of operator time and location. A recent review paper discussed the standardization of flow to achieve consistency and reproducibility and thereby enhance quantitation. So the three major components, data analysis, flow cytometry, the actual instrument itself and sample prep. Unfortunately, we have achieved much progress in two out of the three uh, areas, the data analysis and flow cytometers. In data analysis, there's now automated gating and grouping programs, removing a lot of human judgment from the analysis. Flow cytometers have also improved and most can be easily normalized by using commercially available beads and reagents, virtually making them comparable to any other cytometer. The most challenging component is sample prep. And some people have suggested much more effort for technicians and scientists to strictly follow SOPs and ensure they minimize mistakes and report any deviation. And that may not be a realistic solution. We've heard from many pharma and biotech companies that it's a challenge to train and retain skilled personnel who can perform assays reproducibly. Other factors include the trend of increasingly complex assays, such as mass cytometry experiments, and high-plex fluorescent immunophenotyping assays. Also, flicking plates is an inconsistent function in itself, and we've also heard that many EHS de departments are requesting that users stop this practice to reduce aerosolization of samples. The laminar wash cell washer can minimize many of these challenges I've mentioned. In a conventional wash, wash process, scientists typically use a centrifuge, and a wash tip typically takes 15 to 20 minutes, depending on what your particular protocol is. In contrast, the laminar wash can take care of the entire process automatically in as little as two to, two to three minutes. Also, without centrifugation, cells do not experience any external forces or stress. Now, in this slide, I'm going to show a short movie clip of how the laminar wash system runs. And in the movie, there's two wells in the plate that have droplets of green fluorescent polystyrene beads where my cursor is, and then two droplets where there's food coloring, and then all the other droplets are just containing buffer. So what happens is once the cells and antibodies are placed in the plate, in this case it's the beads, the user places the plate in the washer and hits the start button. The plate goes in and the fluidics head comes down to the plate. In this run, we've lifted the cover of the washer to show the movement of the head. The head has 192 nozzles, so two nozzles per well, and you can see where they come down on these wells. During the two-minute operation, it performs seven cycles of dispensing and aspiration, and that's variable by the user. So when the wash is complete, the plate comes out, and then the picture, as you can see, the food coloring solution is completely gone, which would be a stand-in for antibodies, while the, green, while the green fluorescent beads, or the stand-in for the cells, are retained on the plate. 
Now, you may wonder how come the ink was washed away while the beads were retained. And just to clarify, the beads or cells are not attached to the plate by any interactions. They're simply sitting on the plate held there by gravity. And I'll show you in the next slide a little bit more how this works. So the retention of the beads and the cells on the plate is based on the force of gravity and laminar flow. The secret is that the use of each force is on an almost flat wallless plate. So there's a, just a very slight depression. And so, and by this shape, we can control the forces. The cells are mixed and settled on the plate by gravity. And the settling takes place in 15, 20 minutes or so, usually during the standard incubation periods during a, during a protocol. And then once the cells are settled, the action of dispensing and aspiration above the cells doesn't disturb them. The wash solution forms a laminar flow across the cells and minimizes turbulence of the liquid. The velocity of the fluid is basically becoming zero down by the surface of the cells and at the very bottom of the plate where cells are located. So they're not subjected to movement of buffer. And over this thin fluidic layer, washing happens by diffusion rather than turbulence of the fluid. And this is how we can wash the cells without losing them. When we perform this identical dispensing and aspiration in a conventional walled plate, the action of dispensing and aspiration causes turbulence, which will lift the cells from the bottom. So it's a combination of the shape of the, the wells that are wallless and the flow that's controlled. So now in the next couple of slides, before I turn it over to Jorgen, I just wanna quickly highlight some data we've run with collaborators and customers, and it will complement some of the data that Jorgen will present. The following examples show optimized methods. Every time we work with a customer, we optimize to their specific protocols. And in this case, I'm going to show the method can retain more rare cell populations, particularly cells from tissue samples. The flow rate of dispensing and aspiration can be adjusted to optimize, as we've done here. In this slide, we're showing improved immunophenotyping data for tumor, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And in this case, we see higher retention and better resolution of the populations. This work was done by a very large CRO. And again, this, this data has been optimized for the particular protocol. Now this slide from a, a small company in the Bay Area is from Adisat, and they were very interested in reproducibility between operators. So you can see here between operators, so they've got two operators, we can see enhanced consistency between the operators, especially among the rare cell, cell populations, which they were very interested in. And finally, I want to show how laminar wash, wash technology shows efficient removal. So this is compared to centrifugation, uh, the, the uh, conventional method with the centrifuge and then the laminar wash shows very efficient removal of a stimulant, in this case IL-7, in, in a less than five minutes. And this is shown by the faster decay of PSTAT-5 after the IL-7 removal or washing compared to centrifugation. Now this concludes my introduction of laminar wash. If anybody has any questions, I'll be available at the end, and I'm going to turn it over to Jorgen at this time. My name is Jorgen Olsson. I'm a head for uh, the mass cytometry unit at Linköping University in Sweden, which is part of the SciLife Life National infra Infrastructure. And today, I will talk about my experience using the laminar wash from uh, Curious. I will do an introduction in about the principle in mass cytometry because it's rather important here. In normal flow, you use antibody tagged with a fluorochrome. <laughs> Often you can use several types of fluorochromes, but eventually you end up with a problem with that you have a spectral overlap. So if you try to use 20 fluorochromes at the same time, you get into trouble with these uh, spectral overlaps, which you had to do uh, compensation. When you do compensation, you often get a problem with the, the um, spectral spread. That means, in principle, that uh, low or dim signals will de uh, de uh, be hided by the, the autofluorescence, so to speak, of the cells and also the spread. Uh, nowadays, you have also different types of uh, normal, so say fax flow machines, which using five lasers, 50 parameters, and still they can only get up to 28 or 20, 30 parameters per sample. Even if you use a new technology which is called spectral analysis, the 
most numbers is 28. So if you want to increase the numbers of parameters you would, you would like to see on every cell, you have to go for this technology. At the present time, you can detect 46, 46 uh, different uh, uh, proteins, both in, outside the cell and, or in the cell. But in theory, these technologies you can expand, in fact, to 139. That's the number of metals you can use in this technology. <clears throat> so, other thing uh, one had to consider is that in a normal flow, you're using sheet fluid, and then you have your stream with your cells, single cells. But in this technology, you have these your cells in a liquid coming like droplets and you have argon gas here which then can be considered as uh, sheet fluid. This type of introduction um, is not very stable I would say. Uh, so all the events which go into the system will not reach the detector. The other thing is also that to be able to use this technology you had to put your cells in DE water, not in PBS or something like that, but because the machine will not cope with that. And the third thing, which is rather important when it comes to this um, uh, technology, is that the, the speed is very low. It's roughly 1,000 events per second, and compared to normal flow, you can go up to 20,000 events per second. So, in principle, when you do these type of experiments, you we do all, all, always do barcoding, and when then we do intracellular uh, staining or surface staining. It, it includes 20 washes. So in principle, when you do centrifugation, you lose one third, no, two thirds of your cells just by washing. And due to that, they end up in the water and the instability in this type of system, only one third of the cells will hit the detector. So in principle, that's 16%. In our experience, when we're doing this, we end up around 10 to 12% of the cells. If we start with 1 million, it's 120,000 cells we get out in the analysis. And if you include also barcoding, it they even uh, decrease to roughly 8%. So we have a problem that we don't get so many cells to the detector, uh, which we would like to have. So one way is, of course, to increase the cell number, which is retained in the, when you do the washing. So that's the uh, said about the, uh, the technology. So it's very good to have, look at, when you look at, lots of parameters and also if you look at the intracellular stainings which often is low is very easily detected in this system so this is the principle which we use we don't use when we prepare the samples we use what's called small tube protein stabilizer and principally what we do here is what we have these uh, protein stabilizers and adding one ml of peripheral blood bone marrow it can even be from mouse or uh, humans rat it doesn't matter it works perfectly well in different uh, uh, type of samples and then you just wait for 10 minutes and um, put it in a freezer so then the cells are stabilized and you can just leave them there for just a few days and then you can take them up or store them in a 150 uh, minus freezer until you want to analyze it. And when you do that, you just use the same um, type of small tube for one lice buffer and then there are another lice buffer too which, which you uh, wash the cells, get rid of the red, uh, red cells. And then I have done in this experiment um, uh, replicates three in the three wells in the DA washer and three in three different tubes, which is the common way which we do uh, these analyses. <clears throat> the antibodies which we use is um, in this experiment is just cell surface uh, markers. It's 
mainly uh, a different uh, population which you can find in blood. And here you, on the left side, you can see the different metals which we are using uh, to detect the different uh, antigens. And the workflow. So when you've done the washing through the smart tube solutions, I put the cells when they come to the laminar wash, I put them just on, on, on the plate and let them settle. In centrifugation, you use a recipe band in this barcode perm and wash this twice. And when it comes to laminar flow, uh, wash, uh, I wash it in that machine. It takes roughly the same time, but then you have several more steps. We do barcode, and after that, we wash it, and then we do surface staining, wash it again, and then we put it in 4% uh, of paraformaldehyde, which in the cells are incubated overnight. So the next day, we continue, and then we wash away the paraformaldehyde, and eventually we end up in DD water, washing it in DD water, because when we introduce the cells, they had to be in DD water, not uh, any salt solution, and the cells are pooled. So the first thing you, you realize here is that the, the volume which you are staining, when you do a little conventional flow, I never go down below 100 microliters per sample because the variation is so huge if you go down to 50 microliters or such. But in this uh, laminar wash plate, we all, always stain in 50 microliters. And as you can see after a few slides, it's even get, uh, getting a more reproducible data than doing this in, in a normal epidermal tube. And in uh, mass cytometry, you, you don't have forward side scatter. So we use, to be able to gate our cells, uh, we use which one, uh, uh, one thing which is called event length. <coughs> that is in principle how long time the event takes to get, uh, the whole event to get through the detector. And then we use this uh, method which is called Iridium 191, which is just staining the cells. And here you can see the doublets and triplets. Here we have uh, our single cells, and here we have uh, the, uh, what you would call fragmented cell debris and things like that. So if we gate on this one, and then again against a region 130, 193, and against again iridium 191, these are the cells we would, would like to get. And if you compare the laminar wash uh, to centrifugation, you see one thing directly is that in centrifugation, you get a rather good proportion of events, which is just fragments of cells and debris. And also, not only that, you have more of these doublets and even triplets. And if you compare it, this is roughly 19%. It go down when you're using a laminar wash to roughly 6%. And the doublets also decreasing, like from 9% to 4%. And this is very important because you want, because of the slow speed, of the machine, it takes a very long time. You want all cells to be correct, no doublets. And if you have debris, it can be together with a cell which in fact is correctly uh, barcoded. But if you have a fragment which have a barcode, which is not correct, it will be deleted. And here you see the, the difference between the laminar wash and the centrifugation. In principle, it's just 5% difference. This is done on six to eight experiments. And if you look at the intact cells, it's also just roughly 5%. But in the end, that will give you a huge impact. So um, in uh, mass cytometry, of course, you can look at the different markers uh, in, as a normal flow as dot plots or histograms. But when it comes to these numbers of markers or uh, uh, antigens you, you would like to see, it's become 
rather complicated. So often you use these different types of algorithms like Disney or Spade. We often use the software which is called Cytosplore. And how it works here is in principle that you look at the same time on all markers, in our case, 25 markers, and visualize it in a two-dimensional plot like this. This is a Tisney plot. You can do also the spade plot like this. So principally, it cluster cells dependent on, on the expression of all 25 markers. So that's the way this algorithm works. And an interesting thing to see, if I have the same sample uh, stained at the same day with the same antibody cocktail, but you have three in the plate of the laminar wash and three in different tubes uh, no, where you do the normal centrifugation. So in principle, these three mark, uh, these colors just indicate a different samples. That's sample one or well one, two and three. And here is from centrifugation uh, tube one, two and three. And the principle of this type of Disney plots is that cells which is just near each other, they are very equal. And a cell outside on one part is totally opposite from one in, on the other side. And the same thing if you go from here to here. And the cell is clustering dependent on all 25 markers. So here I know uh, this is myeloid cells, this is T cells, CD4, CD8, NK cells, B cells, I think it's like that. But the most important thing here, you see they just blend together, all the three samples. That means from the three different wells. However, if you look at the centrifugation, although it's the same samples, just divided in three tubes, stained with the same antibody cocktail and washed in the same day and, and, and in the same way, you can see that they are clustering. So the sample one is here, sample two is here, and sample three. And you can even see the in diff, all different population. So I guess this is the CD4 cells, this CD8, and B cells, NK cells, I think it was like that. And you see it, they are clustering like this. So using the laminar wash g give more res repos um, reprodu res reproducibility, although we are staining in only five, 50 microliters. This is done by centrifugation in 100 microliters. And here you can see that it's the, uh, uh, the di uh, difference between the pop uh, different population, although they are totally the same. Another thing which is rather interesting is also that the washer is really good washer. That is that the, all the signals will be a bit lower. And if they are lower in all the 25 markers, they will not uh, cluster on the same spot. So if you look at the left side here, you can see you have one population which is orange and the, this uh, around this border here, you can see another which is more yellow. And these don't even cluster together. So one sample out here is in fact with a laminar wash. Those in here is from the centrifugation. And this is the myeloid population. And this is from the laminar wash, uh, the myeloid population. They don't even cluster together. And you also see that this cluster is more spread. There's more variation when you do the centrifugation compared to the laminar wash. And this is just showing them uh, separate. So here, this is indicating where we have the T cells. And here is the same thing, but for the centrifugation, you have the T cells. They don't even cluster on the same spot. So if you do experiment, you have to decide if you're going for centrifugation or laminar wash, because you can't combine it. At least I can't. So. There is another thing when you come in to when you do these type of uh, washings, uh, if you do the centrifugation, it seems to be biased in that sense that you lose certain type of cells. And this is 
uh, one way to illustrate it. So here, if you do a centrifugation, you will lose these type of cells. So this is now indicative for the marker CD11C. And if you look at the, the laminar wash, you retain a certain population which more or less disappear here. So just by washing, by centrifugation, you get the bias. And the cells you lose is one type, a type of myeloid cells, monocytes or dendritic cells. So in principle, you should, if you, one would like to look at this, one should uh, definitely um, avoid centrifugation, use these laminar wash. When it comes to the number of cells you get through the system, uh, which in fact was the first time, uh, the, the reason why I began to be interested in the laminar wash from uh, Curios is the, that you get out more number of correctly barcoded cells. And it's just lining up different experiments to compare, uh, which I have done. And if you look at the mean value here, it's roughly 11% for the laminar wash. And if you look at the, if you do the normal centrifugation, it's 8.4. So it's an increase of the number correctly barcoded cells, which is roughly 25%. It doesn't seem to be much, but it's huge when it comes to uh, 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 mass, mass cytometry experiments. If one, if one would like to increase this, of course you get, can, in a, um, we have a site of two. If you get a site of three, so uh, Helios, then you can increase it, of course, because it's have a better detection or better introduction to, of the cells. Uh, but I think using this laminar wash, uh, increasing with 25 is, is very good way to get around it if you can't buy a Helios system. So in, in summary, one could say that the, it's, it's time efficient. It's roughly 45 minutes if you just do barcode and so first staining, uh, you gain 25 minutes and it's less hands on on the samples. If you also include intracellular staining, then you gain roughly 20 to 5, 25 minutes more. The one which, thing which I didn't expect it here is, is that you reduce the uh, usage of antibody with roughly 50% and with preserved signal and reproducibility. It has a capacity uh, to more efficiently retain cells and also that it's not biased, that some cells do disappear when you do the certification. And uh, also that the, you have less data variation between the samples. And also a spin-off effect is that it takes less time to acquire all cells in the site of. Thank you so much, Jorgen. That was very informative. And we do have a few questions that have come in. Okay. Okay, the first one. Why do you see banding in the TSNE plots when using the centrifuge? The, the interpretation of that, I can go back to this picture, uh, is that when we do washing in uh, different tubes, we have the same type of antibody cocktail. It seems not that that is the most important or crucial thing, is how you wash your cells. That means you have a variation when you suck up the solution of the centrifugation, and it's not complete. Compared to the laminar wash, it wash in a different way that you have your cells on the bottom and it's the uh, washes is just going above the cells, um, attracting the antibody uh, in the solution, so to speak. So it seemed to be in that way that it's much more efficient in doing using, using the laminar wash compared to centrifugation. That's my interpretation at least. Great, thank you. Next yeah. question. Have you performed any intracellular staining with laminar wash? Yeah, uh, I have. I have been working a lot to get the, this thing 
to work because if you do the normal way, at least the, the common way, it, using methanol to uh, be able to do intercellular staining, it's a complicated because the cells start to float. And one thing you need to the cells to do is that, that they had to go down to the, the bottom and stay there. And if you use different type of intercellular uh, kit, so to speak, they are methyl, uh, methanol based and they just don't work. So uh, just recently I found one which is not based on methanol uh, to permeabilize the cells, which is from uh, e-bioscience. And now I, I got it to work, at least. Great, another question just came in. Did the titer of your antibodies change when adapting the panels to laminar wash system? No, we didn't. We just go uh, went through uh, for the same concentration which we had in the centrifugation as in the laminar wash uh, what you can see there is that you get if you're using the laminar wash the signal get a bit um, lower but you don't get odd population like CD3, CD19 double positives, which I consider is not existing, at least in normal peripheral blood. Uh, why do you think there is more variation with centrifugation? Yeah, it's just, this is also speculation. I think it's because when you have a steady flow, above your cells in a laminar wash. You take it evenly and it seemed to be doing it better than we, uh, when we try to suck out uh, the fluid, when you have this, uh, this pellet in the, when you do the centrifugation, you often uh, leave a certain volume just to avoid to take away, suck up your cells. And that is the variation which seemed to be visualized when you do these type of TSNI plots. Any thoughts on cost per sample? Yeah, these are really obvious uh, that uh, if you're using the, the laminar wash system, you can reduce the antibody cost with half because you, now I can go down to fi 50 microliters uh, compared to centrifugation and still have a better uh, uh, reproducibility using the laminar wash. That's the absolutely the most obvious. And if you compare to normal flow, you often you, you maybe use 10 or 15 markers, but now you use up to 35 or 39 different antibodies per sample. If you can you reduce the, uh, the amount of antibody you need for each sample, of course, the cost benefit is very high. Thank you so much, Jorgen, and we will be posting this on our website. Thanks, everyone, for attending.